and how we as governors can prepare our citizens for the resiliency challenges of the future. Uh, so uh, we're going to have uh, Governor Mills of Maine, Governor Newsom of California, and uh, Governor Burgum of North Dakota. And I'm pleased to welcome Governor Mills to lead the discussion with the governors. And, yeah, I guess that's it. I thought they were going to put chairs up here, but you guys, I guess we'll do it from the thing. I'm not in charge of moving the seats. Thank you, Governor Hogan. I uh, welcome to all of you to this, dis this discussion about fortifying our future, uh, the state's becoming more resilient. Let me start by talking about my own state because I'm getting ready to pitch it anyway. For the August 5 to 7 uh, summer meeting, the NGA in Portland, Maine. But my state has 1.3 million people. It's small. It's the most dispersed population of any state in the country. It sort of juts out of the northeast corner of the country like a thumb hitchhiking towards Europe. Borders Canada, we only, we're the only state that only borders one other state other than Hawaii, Alaska. Um, we're 90% forested. We have clean water and rolling hills and fertile, land, uh, fertile farmlands and mighty rivers and deep ports. And if you take our state and stretch it out as far as you can, the coastline, as jagged and crazy as it is with all the islands, you'll find about 3,500 miles of ocean coastline. So it's remarkable in many areas. But we're seeing the effects of um, disasters, both natural and man-made. Uh, in the small town of Machias, for instance, one of our easternmost towns, we saw extensive flooding in their, in their historic downtown during the 2018 winter storm. Vinyl Haven, the beautiful uh, island right across from the island where Governor Lamont summers, um, a beautiful island off the coast, it lands 10% of Maine's lobster catch. But the offshore island, that island itself, could lose more than 10% of its land to sea level rises, rising by 2100, including much of its working waterfront. We're very concerned about preserving our working waterfronts. With state funding, Vinyl Haven is taking some critical steps to understand their vulner vulnerability and plan for the future. In Portland, where I do, go, do again look forward to greeting you in August, uh, is they're already seeing a threefold increase in average, average annual hours of flooding in the past 20 years versus the past 100 years. That's impacting businesses along the commercial wa working waterfront and the working class bayside neighborhoods. The city is now developing a, a plan, a comprehensive climate action plan. And our state, since I took over 14 months ago, has taken some decisive actions uh, to prepare our infrastructure and our citizens for the incidents that could disrupt the entire state. Mitigation, I think, is the best adaptation uh, strategy. The cost of avoiding the worst of climate change impacts is far lower than the cost of uh, uh, not adapting uh, and living in the worst case scenario. So the, some of the steps we're taking, we want to try to cut emissions. 53% of our greenhouse gas emissions are from transportation sources. We're addressing that. Um, since January 2019, my state has joined uh, the 25 states of the U.S. Climate Alliance, which represents now 55 percent of the United States population. And we've set a goal to achieve statewide carbon neutrality by 2045, because we are seeing rising oceans. The Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99 percent of all ocean bodies. With the legislature's agreement, we established the Maine Climate Council which will recommend a plan, a more comprehensive plan, this December. And they're looking at transportation sources, heating sources, uh, and um, resiliency. We're the, most heat, we're the most fossil fuel dependent state when it comes to heating sources. Uh, we've set in statute a requirement that there would be a 45% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and an 80% reduction by 2050. We've taken great pains to redo our renewable portfolio standards. Um, we're looking at 80% renewables by 2030, up from 40%, uh, and a goal of 100% renewable power by 2050. We have the most significant renewable standards in the country. And we've established by law an aggressive goal of inst installing 100,000 heat pumps by 2025. Many of us were at the Korean, Korean ambassador's residence last night, and he was describing the architecture of the building and how it was modeled on uh, historical uh, homes in Korea. 
And I looked up and above our heads were two large heat pumps. And I thought, well, that's adaptation. <laughs> and uh, in the house, the governor's mansion where I reside during the week, there are 22 heat pumps. Those were put in by my predecessor. So it's a bipartisan effort to reduce our, our dependency on fossil fuels for heat. Um, and we're supporting electrification to facilitate that. We think Maine consumers can save on their heating bills and save costs overall by using heat pumps. Um, we have facilitated the launch of the first floating offshore wind demonstration project in the United States with leadership and research from the University of Maine, which has developed the prototype for a floating offshore wind platform that is concrete-based, not steel-based, uh, much, much more adaptable to manufacturing onshore uh, and to movement on, sh uh, on the coast with support from the Federal Department of Energy. We've launched uh, an electric vehicle rebate program and charging infrastructure programs using not taxpayer monies, but the Volkswagen settlement funds. Some of us who were former attorneys general, like Mr. Bashir, Mr. Cooper, myself, um, uh, and Mr. Bullock, sued Volkswagen of America over several respects in, in, in tandem with the federal government. Uh, and we're using those monies in the state of Maine to provide rebates for consumers to purchase electric, electric vehicles uh, and to increase our infrastructure across the state of Maine for, infra, for uh, electric vehicle charging stations. So we know that we have to prepare our state and our, our communities for climate change and impacts that can't be avoided. Our governor's office of the future, during my campaign for governor, I often quoted Kurt Vonnegut, who once said, every government every cabinet ought to have a department of the future. I said, we don't have that in Maine. Now we do. <laughs> it's called an Office of Innovation, Policy, Innovation, and the Future, uh, which I created. And we've hired a senior climate resilience coordinator, fancy term, to lead our communities uh, dealing with issues on climate change and accommodations and resiliency, adaptation to rising sea levels, uh, warming seas, and the like. We're investing in the replacement and upgrading of road infrastructure at steam crossings. I think that could be summarized in one word. Culverts, the more modern culverts. They don't strangle the fish and let them pass easily. Um, and those projects will mitigate flood risks, road washouts, and reduce erosion impacts to streams, brooks, and lakes. And that project itself has brought together unlikely suspects, but environmentalists, sports men and women, uh, contractors, building contractors have all come together behind the culvert projects in our state. They all see an advantage to their interests there. Our Maine Climate Council's Community Resiliency uh, Working Group is exploring ways to prepare our public health system for climate-induced or, intens uh, or intensified health impacts, including tick-borne diseases. We're seeing a lot of ticks come up from the south because of warming climate, warming uh, temperatures. So the deer and moose population have been impacted by that. You can fly over some of the woods in Maine and see moose that have been eaten raw by ticks. And that, of course, can bring Lyme disease as well. Looking at foodborne and waterborne disease outbreaks and even the mental health impacts of disasters and heat waves and floods. We're protecting infrastructure assets that are critical to public safety and to Maine's economy. Providing technical assistance and funding programs to Maine's small and rural towns so they can do their own resilience work, not lay, lie back and think about what it was like 20, 40, 50 years from uh, ago, but look to the future. See what changes you can predict. The Governor's Energy Office and Maine Emergency Management are improving and updating our energy assistance or assurance and energy management plan, including discussions around vulnerable infrastructure, utility lines, um, cybersecurity, grid management. Maine's Climate Council's Energy Work Group is identifying strategies to increase resiliency of our assets, our energy assets and grid infrastructure against severe weather and natural hazards. Two years ago, we had a terrific wind, windstorm around Halloween. The, basically, the state went dark and <laughs> lost power for three days. We want to make sure that kind of thing doesn't happen again. So those efforts are a start, uh, but Maine now has an opportunity to develop a more comprehensive and coordinated framework for resiliency. Um, the magnitude of adaptation in our small state is, is still daunting. Consider that this narrow slice of infrastructure, 12 to 15 of Maine's 50 plus wastewater treatment plants 
are highly vulnerable to sea, sea level rise. Don't think too long about that. <laughs> Upgrading just, just those assets alone, wastewater treatment plants, will carry a price tag in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And we just heard about the discussion of the federal government's uh, participation in infrastructure plans or non-participation at this point. Our roads and piers, waterfronts, our grid, our communities will each need investments at that scale or higher. Maine is looking to nearby states like Rhode Island and Connecticut and New York, which have inf infrastructure banks, I understand, or green banks, to finance large resilience projects. Maine, New York, Massachusetts, New York, and Minnesota have robust technical assistance programs that guide and support and provide funding to communities for resiliency, uh, resilience and sustainability. I think states should also pursue opportunities for collaboration. We all, sh in the Northeast and the New England states, we share the grid. Uh, we should push for policies for, of a national or regional infrastructure bank, that kind of thing. That could be, that could be one such opportunity for collaboration. So we've come a long ways. Uh, we're digging deep. We, uh, I lifted, one of the first things I did was to lift the moratorium my predecessor had imposed on wind power. We're looking seriously at more land-based wind power, more solar. We lifted the uh, restrictions on net metering so that there were more solar power projects, more than 300 community solar projects waiting permitting right now all across the state of Maine. And again, looking at offshore wind, not just looking at it, developing it with research uh, done by our university. So I'm looking to hear, looking forward to hearing what other states have done to meet similar threats. Uh, given the extent of our waterfront, coastal waterfront, that's the major impact that we have in Maine. Um, so looking forward to hearing from the rest of you. Thank you, Governor Mills. Uh, Doug Bergham from North Dakota, and I'm pleased to be on this resiliency panel with Governor Newsom and Governor Mills. Uh, we, this, uh, I don't know, Governor Hogan, maybe you strategically created this panel by having the uh, farthest northeast coast and the west coast and then the north coast, some people might think, in North Dakota. But uh, for those geographic quiz for everybody, uh, where is the center of North America? Answer, Rugby, North Dakota is the center of North America. So uh, maybe misnamed North Dakota, we should be called Center Dakota. Uh, but in the middle of that, this great continent of ours, uh, we get hit with all kinds of things. And just in the past year, we've got, uh, we've had floods, we've had droughts uh, in the same year. Uh, we've had tornadoes. Uh, I think the only thing we discovered this morning uh, from talking to Governor Ige is we have not had any homes buried in lava, uh, which he had. So we're, but in terms of uh, resiliency in our state, uh, which is a, one of the most recently settled places on the planet. Uh, of course, we had tribal nations that were there, primarily nomadic for centuries, uh, Scandinavian and German immigration uh, in the 1880s and 1890s. And so we've got a very short history. And sometimes when you build, uh, the built environment meets the natural environment. Uh, there's a collision between those two things. And we think about resiliency, but part of it goes back to uh, us having an understanding of how we design our cities, where we build our cities, uh, and how we build our, our communities. And when we think about that uh, today and the dependency we have on all kinds of hidden infrastructure, include whether it's the power grid, uh, water systems, all those things, as Governor Mills said, it's important to have resiliency there. And I think one thing for all governors to understand is that we're on the front lines of a new battle relative to resiliency in our, inter in our, in our uh, infrastructure. And that's that I'm sure if you talk to any of your chief information officers, they will tell you that every day, every state, many of our communities are under attack. Uh, not from hackers that are sitting in the basement in their pajamas, but we're under attack from foreign national uh, efforts to try to break into uh, the key assets that we have and all the data that we have and certainly the, the power grids and the infrastructure that we have. And, and this is uh, for, for a state like ours uh, that is uh, part of two of the nation's uh, grids, a state like ours that includes uh, some of the nation's most important air bases and missile defense, uh, the fact that we can have uh, foreign nationals trying to hack into a local 200 person school district uh, to get access to information there to, because the parents of those kids work for the National Guard in the state and the National Guard in our state has the full-time mission of protecting those missile bases. Uh, you can see where uh, there's risks uh, in hidden ways that go well beyond uh, the important things that we work on every day like, like flood protection. Uh, 
Broadband, of course, is uh, critical for us to deliver health care and education in rural areas. Uh, our state at 71,000 square miles is uh, about exactly the same size as all six New England states combined. Uh, and, and so we've got real challenges in covering uh, all of that distance. And, and one of the things that we can do to make smart decisions about how we build infrastructure, even in a small state like ours, we'll have spent over, uh, by the time we're done with the current projects that are planned, over $3 billion on flood protection. Uh, to protect our major cities of Fargo, Grand Forks, Minot, and Bismarck. When we're doing that uh, and we're spending billions of dollars, the question you ask yourself is how much information do we have on the data that goes into the hydrology models that tells us how to build flood protection? And the answer is very little. Uh, we we've, we've really are in a thing where there's an imbalance, and when we're talking about spending trillions of dollars at the federal level on infrastructure, I think we've got to carve off, you know, one or two percent, and what, which would mean uh, billions and billions of dollars to spend on, on data collection. And we've really invested this in North Dakota because we're past the era where you can hire a state employee and give them a clipboard and a pickup and have them drive around the state and try to collect data. Uh, human collected data is expensive and efficient. Automatically collected data can be accurate and low cost. Uh, and so with this, uh, you know, push towards uh, innovation over regulation, which is how we think about all of these issues, uh, we're, we're, we're working uh, right now uh, in a whole across every agency to increase the amount of automatically collected data we have to help increase that resilience. Uh, for our folks that work in flood control across the state, uh, we've, we've dis we have deployed a thing we call presence, which is uh, pushing remote uh, systems data uh, for solar powered uh, collection for hydrology information. Now instead of just collecting them on the major rivers, we can go to streams and other places that might only be flooded seasonally. Don't have to send somebody out there to do a, a check. We're automatically collecting data. We've got a project called Wise Roads where we were doing all kinds of road closures that are important for both industry and human safety. But sometimes we're doing that off a weather report. We might be closing roads across an entire uh, part of the state when if we actually had automatically collected data built into the roads themselves. We could be more precise about which roads were open or safe or the cost of having deploy to, uh, to, to keep those roads open and clean. Uh, all of you, all governors here have got a huge network of pipelines across our nation. There's over 38,000 river crossings for natural gas, oil, and other pipelines in our nation. Uh, when I took office three years ago, I had to ask a question, where are they? Uh, how old are they? What kind of condition are they in? Uh, very hard to get a hold of that data, and I would encourage other governors to ask your teams to think about that. Uh, some of the new ones are probably in great shape. Some of the old ones built 50 years ago probably present some risk, but there is an, there is an opportunity, again, uh, through uh, automatically collected data. And so our state uh, challenged the pipeline industry uh, to step forward. We created a private-public partnership uh, where the state is putting up uh, R&D dollars that match the private sector in a shark tank-like environment where they're competing for ideas and we've got uh, four ideas that have been funded uh, that can all be potentially transformational. One is a sat satellite-based satellitics uh, that would allow us to do satellite analytics and be able to detect early detection before you actually have a spill uh, you detect. Uh, and again, we're, we're not trying to build like black boxes for the airline industry so we can tell you after we have a spill, we're trying to create solutions that detect ahead of time. Uh, another, another one of those is intelligent paint, where there'd actually be sensors in the paint, so the paint at the uh, intersection of the, the joints, which is where the weak spots are and most of the leaks would occur, could actually detect it ahead of time. Uh, we have a, another one people I'm sure know, oh, pipelines, so, you know, we just run a pig down there, now they got smart pigs. Many of the older pipelines, too many twists and turns, geologic shifts, diameters might change. You're not able to do that, so there's a company that's uh, created a product called a piper. It's the size of a golf ball. You drop it into the pipeline, it floats down in any fluid, and it can acoustically detect whether or not there's going to be uh, some kind of uh, problem or not. And then finally, uh, when you get humans interacting with data, alarm fatigue can happen. That can happen in healthcare. It certainly happens in, uh, in many kind of, uh, if you're in a, been, ever been to a pipeline monitoring station, but uh, you, one company's teaming up with IBM Watson to create an artificial intelligence solution which would use big data artificial intelligence to be able to detect even the slightest changes in pressure that may indicate that there's a problem. So this is all in a matter of a couple of years, and I think as people in government, we tend to tend to lean hard on regulation when there's a problem, then we're going to, you know, and we have a natural disaster, then we're going to come up with a bunch of regulations never happen again, and I think you need to uh, have in your, in your toolkit uh, as leaders to understand that with, you know, Moore's Law driving doubling of 
of uh, digital power every 18 months at half the price, that there are solutions that you know, couldn't even be imagined by the time we get a regulation implemented and an inspector and a pickup driving around. If that takes four to six years to get it through your state legislator and do it, by that time we've turned the crank on Moore's Law three or four more times and you could have solutions like this that are actually uh, really, really help our resilience. And the same thing uh, with cybersecurity. I'm confident that there isn't any uh, state in the nation that's spending too much on cybersecurity, and as any of you have had communities or universities that have been hit uh, with uh <clears throat> with any kind of ransomware or have been shut down like some of our large municipalities have. Uh, the adage is on cybersecurity that you will be happily to spend millions or tens of millions of dollars after the fact uh, when, when your legislature might have been unwilling to spend you know, dimes ahead of time. And so we have uh, got the support of our legislature and we're, uh, we're trying to spend more than dimes but trying to spend that ahead of time to, to build that up because this is uh, one of our biggest resiliency uh, risks. So uh, look forward to questions, but again, thanks for uh, for inviting North Dakota to be on this panel. You had me an intelligent paint, which I'm a, <laughs> I made a note. Uh, by the way, if I may, just I, I got a brief a little preamble because I'm going to paint a very dystopian picture of California. So can I just briefly, before I do that, make a case for California? Uh, at, you know, it's a remarkable time because we're enjoying a $21.5 billion operating surplus, record reserves, bond ratings increased uh, twice in the last a year, 119 consecutive months of net job growth. Um, the state's average 3.8 percent GDP over the last five years. And, and it's not my state of state. But I need to say that because the state of our state um, has been highlighted in the national news and in your consciousness that it's a state on fire. It's a state that has the largest utility in the United States of America, PG&E, that's in bankruptcy because of the fires. Uh, if any of you still are confused by science and still don't believe in climate change, come to California. Uh, Mother Nature has joined the conversation. The hots are getting hotter, the dries are getting drier, the wets are getting wetter. We just came out of a five-year drought, three of the worst fire seasons in California history during that period of time, the one that generated a lot of uh, national consciousness and attention appropriately was the campfire. Brought President Trump out there. We're grateful for his visit. 18,804 structures were lost just in that one fire. 85 human beings lost their lives. The year before, we had the Tubbs fire that also generated an enormous amount of news attention. 23 lives lost, 7,492 structures lost in that fire. All of you are paying the price for that. All of you generously have helped support our efforts on debris removal, and FEMA support. Uh, many of you around this room, quite literally, I look at four governors that were kind enough to send us uh, a lot of resources in the last uh, fire season, um, which is really now fire cycle year-round. But in the peak of our season, you were generous enough to send mutual aid from all across the country, from obviously places closer to home like Oregon and Washington State, but as far away as Montana, uh, where we were seeing assets brought bare. We are sharing assets, you may have seen, uh, in Australia. We lost one of our C-130 uh, training planes uh, that we sent over for the fire suppression efforts in Australia. That Tragically, that plane crashed. Uh, it gives you a sense of the mutuality as it relates to this and what's happening not just in the United States and western part of the states, uh, but also around the rest of the world. So we're trying to meet this head on. We got a bankrupt utility. We're trying to get out of bankruptcy. Um, but they're feeling the pressure of trying to underground and, and harden uh, 150,000 miles uh, of overhead wire. Uh, and they're operating conditions the likes of which they never could have imagined a decade or two ago. We got 1,000 miles of coast. Uh, I grew up in San Francisco. Uh, we mark uh, a, literally a century ago, eight inches, uh, the sea level rise just in the last century. We expect that to increase exponentially uh, into the new century, losing our beaches, uh, 150 million trees that have died in the state of California because of the drought. Uh, and obviously the impacts in the economy are pretty severe, particularly as an ag state. So we have all the same audacious goals. You know, we're all 100% here, 100% there. We're all competing in that, but we're really now in the how business. And we've got to apply those goals. We've got to implement our strategies. And one of the areas that I just want to offer, and I try to be brief because I'm sensitive to time, is 
Our fully functioning cap and trade program has provided some $8.6 billion of investments that have allowed us to drive innovation, drive technology solutions, uh, and drive strategies. Our policies have really accelerated uh, investments and economic opportunities in this space. California, as a large oil producing state, now has five times as many green tech jobs as we do fossil fuel jobs. We're proof of that paradigm. It's no longer an and, or rather an or, it's clearly uh, an economic imperative for us to move in this direction and transition to low carbon green growth. But the most exciting thing we're doing, at least from my humble perspective this year, is we're getting our pension system, all $700 billion in our two large pension systems, to start aligning investment strategies uh, in our climate resiliency frame. Uh, and that is a very meaningful thing. That's an opportunity to truly move markets. I put a billion dollars in this year's budget up for a climate uh, catalyst fund. Uh, what was interesting about doing that immediately generated interest from the Gates Foundation and others that are looking to potentially partner uh, with the state of California uh, to provide additional resources to really catalyze an innovation construct and mindset in the state. Uh, it's a long way of saying this. Uh, from the ashes that we have quite literally uh, been working our way through, tremendous opportunities present themselves in this space, uh, but the imperative of meeting this moment is profound. Uh, and I just hope we can move past the, you know, uh, this dialectic back and forth and folks can start to wake up to this reality in a more meaningful uh, and systemic way. And as I said, uh, we're going to need all the help and all the partnerships we possibly can get. Uh, and I think this is in closing very exciting because just to hear Governor Mills, Governor, you guys talking about the best practices. This is a kind of enlightened competition uh, and I think significant opportunity for all of us, particularly at NGA, to start sharing uh, a collaborative spirit regardless of party uh, to really push through an agenda that we all can be proud of. So I thank you guys for your leadership and Governor Hogan, thanks for uh, having this opportunity to dialogue. Time for questions. Okay, good. Questions from other governors? I mean, we'd like to hear from your states too and how you're interacting with your local governments in particular on emergency disaster efforts and preparation, mitigation. Nobody's doing that? John Bell. Thank you very much, Governor, and uh, thank all three of you. I really appreciate the information and, and you sharing what you're doing in your states. We're no stranger to disaster uh, in Louisiana, you know, and most notably going back uh, to Hurricane Katrina, but since then, multiple floods. We're ground zero for coastal land loss because of subsidence and coastal erosion, but also sea level rise. Uh, but we have a conference uh, in New Orleans where the NGA is actually partnering with RESCON. Uh, and this is one of the premier conferences anywhere in the world about resiliency. It's about preparing for and recovering from disasters, and it will include now cybersecurity. Uh, so I want to put a plug in for this conference with all of the governors. Uh, hopefully you can attend, but at the very least, send someone uh, to New Orleans. I think they will get a tremendous amount out of it to the benefit of your state. It happens to be April the 28th through the 30th uh, in New Orleans. And just so you know, uh, the Jazz Fest will be going on at that time. Uh, so you might want to come personally. Uh, but I, I can guarantee you it will be a rewarding experience, uh, one where, where you will learn from academia, uh, international organizations, uh, other states, uh, and business uh, folks from the private sector as well. So I, I would encourage all of you to, to give some thought about coming down to New Orleans April 28th through 30th, or at least sending uh, some folks from your administrations. That's great. Everybody planning to go? I, now I am. <laughs> Well, what about interactions with local governments? How do you help prepare them for uh, these kinds of efforts? Our, our biggest stress is, is land use. We've got 11 million people living in the WUI, this wildland urban interface. And right now, because of these wildfires, folks are having a hard time getting insurance. They're not being renewed. The premiums have gone through the roof. We've got a state plan, the FAIR plan now, where we're seeing huge premium spikes and the ability to absorb uh, all the private sector uh, abandonment there is going to be challenged. Wow. So, it, you know, we're, we're trying, the, the stubbornness on land use is difficult and localism is determinative from a land use perspective, but this is perhaps the most significant thing we can do in terms of being uh, 
future-proofed in terms of addressing the issue of resiliency broadly because there's a general sense of retreat now on the coast, on the coastal bluffs and the like, uh, losing again beaches and the erosion, uh, the king tides now happening not every 100 years, every 10 years, every year, uh, and the challenges uh, associated again with that wildland urban interface in particular make for a vexing uh, relationship at the moment between the state and local government. Are the towns and the local uh, communities adapting by, by changing their zoning patterns, their zoning rules, ordinances in either of your states? We haven't seen it yet. <laughs> I mean, no, you know, it's, 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 it's difficult. Some of the, you know, we, we got a housing crisis in California. Last thing we want to do is tell folks not to build housing, particularly in areas where the land's a lot cheaper than some of the urban environments. But it's, um, you know, you see these master plan communities right in the middle of these zones and you go, what the hell are these guys thinking? Mm -hmm. um, and again, all, you, you go up to that campfire uh, area. I mean, there's a fire tornadoes coming through. One, only one part of that community you can get out. Uh, everybody, I mean, I was, you saw all those videos. Uh, and we're seeing that replicated over and over in all parts of our state. And so we're, we may come down a little more aggressively with a hammer from the state level. Uh, but again, uh, local government, as we all know, so those come from it. Uh, that's a stubborn issue to address. Uh, I would just say, yeah, we're coming from a state where we believe a lot in local control uh, and self-determination, but even with that, we have to understand that we're in a country where uh, most of the built environment in the last uh, 80 years in this country has been built with uh, that's been automobile-centric and not mm -hmm. people-centric. Uh, and with that, you end up generally with communities that have been built out, not up. Uh, and that creates, uh, you know, the cost of, of uh, local government, school districts, park districts, uh, all their costs go up, rising property taxes, uh, lots of infrastructure to, to maintain. I'm sure the, the numbers we had on the national numbers include all the, you know, all that horizontal growth. But as a state, we're trying to really, through a thing we call the Main Street Initiative, try to drive private capital to existing infrastructure. That's the highest return for taxpayers if you can get private capital to go back in uh, where you've got existing infrastructure as opposed to the opposite, which would be public capital, which is we had a school district that builds a new school, you know, out in a greenfield site a mile or two out of town because the land is cheap. That's actually very expensive for taxpayers. So mm -hmm. trying to, you know, we've built dashboards for every community so they can see their own data uh, and try to educate the local decision makers so that they can understand the decisions, the design decisions on where and how you build uh, really make a difference on what then we have to rebuild after we've had a disaster. But the, you know, the good thing about North Dakota is that virtually everybody in the state has is so close to our agricultural roots where it doesn't matter what year it is, you're dealing with things you can't control with Mother Nature, uh, good years and bad years. And so we've got a lot of people who've got uh, you know perseverance and fortitude and willing to work through that. So we've got a good spirit of cooperation. But it, uh, some of these decisions are, are we're going to have to think differently about the future than we have in the past. And I'd say again on that, you know, technology is changing uh, every job, every company, and every industry. And it's certainly you know blowing up segments like retail and a lot of communities you know built outwards because they're trying to accommodate drive through restaurants and big box retailers and that those models are all under threat uh, yeah. because of the of internet retail selling and so again there's an opportunity on those former big box sites for all kinds of infill opportunities to come back and build really tax efficient walkable communities which helps increase health increase a sense of community increases a lot of things that we also spend money on the back yeah. end because we're a nation that walks less than any other nation yeah. wow even in North Dakota yes <laughs> Thank you very much. Any other questions from other governors? Yes, Mr. Governor Herbert. Thank you, Governor Mills. Um, Governor Edwards just reminded me of a lesson I learned from Louisiana. Uh, I was uh, visited there about 15 years ago and saw the devastation from Hurricane uh, Katrina and Rita. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Mitch Landrieu, now I think he well, he's maybe not the, the mayor of New Orleans now, but he, he became the mayor of New Orleans. And he took me around and showed me what had taken place there and kind of the, the successes and the failures of government. Hmm. And some of it was the people weren't prepared. And so out of that uh, incident, uh, what we learned in Utah was to put together a program where we enhanced the first responders, local government, which would be the cities and then the counties, and then the state. The federal government's a little slower to react. They can help pay bills and come and mm. do the aftermath, but they're not going to be the first responders. 
And we also put together a program that helps us prepare families, individuals, 72-hour uh, kits. You know, it's always been asked, you know, we call it Be Ready Utah. Be ready for what? Well, fill in the blank. We could have fire, floods, earthquake, drought. Uh, we've had all of the above. Uh, but individuals and families need to take on the responsibility of themselves. Uh, we work with our schools, so they have a 12-step a, a program, what they need to be doing at the schools, along with the 12-step program for families and individuals. They can go to our webpage and get instructions and, uh, and find out how to take care of, how do you turn off the natural gas into your home? Uh, yeah. How do you secure your uh, medicines? Your, what do you do about your pets? What about elderly people, or maybe or your family or your neighbors? And then we work, took a third step, and that was the private sector businesses. If you have that kind of acute problem, the next thing you have looting. Somebody's going to the local Walmart and stay, taking uh, you know, uh, some kind of uh, uh, issue, whether it be a generator or uh, something to help mm -hmm. with your water purification, things you should have had on hand. And so we have now a consolidated four-step program, private sector, school, business, and government all working in concert under the heading of Be Ready Utah. It's going to help us, it has helped us already when we've had some fires, wow. to have uh, the first responders taken care of, neighbors act, uh, government comes in and takes care of the, the mop up, the clean up, but it's a concerted combined effort, mm -hmm. not just looking for the federal government to come in and bail us out. So anyway, it's working for Utah, and again, I thank uh, Louisiana for sharing us that information, which created a great program in Utah. Thank you, Governor Herbert. It's like, you know, everybody says it can't happen here until it does happen here. And it can happen in any one of our states. Uh, these disasters, whether cold, hot, wet, dry, uh, and we've got to be ready. I think we've all sat back for years and years and thought, well, if something bad happens, FEMA will come in, the federal government will help us out. We've got to start this at home and, as you said, build, building families resiliency uh, businesses locally is important, bottom up. Thank you very much. I think that ends this panel discussion. Uh, if, I'm going to take the liberty of moving into a brief uh, presentation about the great state of Maine. <laughs> Floods, blizzards, and rains, and, <laughs> and r rising waters notwithstanding. <clears throat> We're inviting you all to visit our <laughs> great state uh, in the city of Portland on August 5th to 7th. Uh, we have a booth outside where you can pick up some chocolate-covered blueberries, best blueberries in the, in the world, wild blueberries. We're also going to offer a lobster bake on an island in Casco Bay. We're working on some really dynamic speakers for this summer conference. Uh, Portland, Maine, not to be confused with Portland, Oregon. Portland, Maine has been cited by Bon Appetit and others as the foodie capital of the country now. There will be exciting uh, delicacies and restaurants to uh, enjoy. Maine has become home to more than 150 craft breweries, if you like craft brews. All of that will be at your fingertips um, when you come to Portland, August 5th to 6th, 7th. Um, and we, I want to extend a personal invitation to every one of you. Hope you can make it. It's going to be informative and fun. And I think that there's a film to be shown yeah. somewhere. Hello, I'm Maine Governor Janet Mills. I have been, to put it mildly, gently encouraging the National Governors Association to hold their next summer meeting in Portland for a little while now. And guess what? It's happening. I'm excited and thrilled to be able to host you all as guests in my great state this coming August. So, now that it's happening, let me offer a little trip planning advice. One, make sure you book your travel to Portland, Maine, and not that other Portland or any of the other Portlands across the country. I'm sorry, Governor Brown, but after all, Portland, Maine was founded first. Two, when you come for the meeting, be sure to schedule in some sightseeing time for yourself and your families. Whether it's our western mountains, our lakes and streams, great for fishing, our rolling fields and forests, or our 3,500 miles of iconic rocky coastline and gorgeous islands, there's something for everyone, and the weather's gonna be great. Plus, from the Old Port to the Arts District, with museums and shows to historic parks and forts along Casco Bay and the Atlantic Ocean, Portland, Maine has a lot to offer you this summer. Finally, I shouldn't say finally, it gets people's hopes up, but finally, 
Enjoy our wonderful food. Maine has so much superb cuisine to offer you. Governor Hogan, I know you love your Maryland crabs, but we've got lobster. It's worth a try. Plus, Portland, Maine was named the best restaurant city of the year, and I hope you will all find out why. I am thrilled to welcome you all to Maine next summer. You know, re-engaging with the NGA and getting to know all of you, hearing your challenges and your successes, proposing new solutions with you has been of tremendous benefit to me as governor. And I look forward to building on those relationships. Thank you, and I hope to see you all in August for the NGA Summer Meeting 2020. I've never had, I've never had the opportunity to introduce myself before. That was a little bizarre. Well, Governor Mills, thank you very much for leading the panel, and thank you so much for hosting us in Maine. I think it's going to be a terrific visit. And uh, while uh, uh, you know we can have an argument about Maryland crabs and, and, and Maine lobster, I'll, I'll just settle for eating both of them. How about that? Uh, but thank you very much. Our next session will uh, explore workforce solutions, pathways to uh, prosperity. And uh, to begin that today's discussion, uh, we have Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson, who is the chair of the NGA's uh, Education and Workforce Committee. And he's going to lead a discussion on how states can provide workforce training. Uh, and uh, Governor Hutchinson will be joined by Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds. Uh, and she's going to talk about uh, steps that her state is taking to change lives and improve states' economies through workforce and reentry. I also want to take uh, the, the, this moment to, uh, while we're talking about the summer conference in Maine in August, uh, at that very conference, uh, we're going to have a new vice chairman of the NGA. And uh, we took a unanimous vote yesterday. And Gov Governor Asa Hutchinson is going to be the next ch uh, vice chair of the NGA. And I want to congratulate him. Thank you, Go Governor. Uh, with that, we'll turn the, the floor over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Governor Hogan, uh, for your leadership. And, and also, thank you for being a good campaign manager for me. Uh, I appreciate the direction you're taking the NGA. Uh, every day, uh, governors face uh, workforce challenges, but governors across the country continue to find uh, the best solutions. And to kick off this session highlighting workforce strategies for governors, I'm going to feature some of the work that we are doing in Arkansas to create second chances for formerly incarcerated individuals. And I'm delighted to also hear from Governor Reynolds uh, a little bit later uh, to uh, tell us some of the things that are happening in Iowa. Whenever I uh, uh, got elected governor, and actually when I ran for governor, I was told that whenever they left uh, prison after however many years they served there, they would be given $100 and a bus ticket. And I said, that's not much chance for success of not reoffending. And I made that comment publicly, and I've actually been reminded of that from time to time because uh, those that are uh, paying their penalty in prison, uh, they hear those comments and they listen attentively, and, and those that want a second chance are looking for that opportunity. And so as a result of that commitment and the, uh, uh, the need that we have in our state and across the country, uh, we reinvigorated our reentry programs enhanced our training for those that are coming out of prison, and enlisted also the help of the private sector. Uh, I called it the Restore Hope Initiative, in which I brought uh, faith-based organizations, uh, uh, private uh, organizations together, and said the state can't do it all. Uh, we can put some funding for reentry beds, but we need your help to give them a chance, and also to re-enlist the employer community so that they will uh, open up their doors and not just eliminate someone because they checked the box because they have a prior offense. And so enlisting them changed the dynamics totally, increased the numbers of employers that participating, and then also uh, helping them to have health coverage as they left prison uh, re relieves a burden on them. Uh, I have the habit of going uh, to a coffee shop uh, there in uh, Little Rock area, and as I go in there, I entered. I met uh, this one lady behind the counter, and she whispered to me and said, 
that uh, she had left prison, uh, that she has a job, she had a big smile on her face, and uh, she's in part of the reentry program that we started. And so about once a week I go in there and I check on her. So I have my own reentry check system, but it's exciting to see uh, the progress that people make in life, the commitment and how they seek a second chance and the struggles that they go through. One final thing that we're doing is that we created a two-year scholarship program for particular fields, high need areas of employment. And this is for high school students primarily that are coming out that need a nursing. We're paying full tuition and fees for them to go in and get the skill training up to two years uh, in a two-year college. Well, I said, well, how about someone that uh, has been out of the workforce for years and want to re-enter it, a non-traditional student? And uh, they hadn't thought of that, but we made that program, that two-year uh, free tuition program, available for non-traditional students. And guess what? That would apply to someone coming out looking for an opportunity to get the training they need. So we're reaching out in a number of different areas. And now I'm pleased to introduce Arkansas's lead on prison reentry, Assistant Director at Community Corrections, Carrie Williams. Uh, Carrie's leadership has been critical in, to the success of our reentry program in Arkansas. She also sits on the Governor's Occupational Licensing Advisory Board, so she uh, brings unique insight to this issue. Carrie, thank you for joining us today. And if you could tell us a little bit more about what's happened in the reentry programs in Arkansas. Thank you, Governor Hutchison. And thank you, what an honor it is to be here to represent the state of Arkansas in the reentry efforts that we've done under Governor Hutchison's tenure. What we have learned is that reentry is a process and it's not a program that somebody starts and finishes while they're incarcerated. It starts at intake and then it is uh, completed upon their successful reentry. We have been very successful in the efforts, and we've also learned that it takes just more than one or two silver bullets to attack these issues and to address these barriers. There's a multitude of issues that must be identified and connected to a resource while incarcerated and after release. To hit on some of the things that we're currently working on, we know that well over 80% of the inmates that are incarcerated have a substance use issue. So we are addressing those intently. We've identified them at intake and we work them through the program while they're incarcerated. We continue that to a handoff to community supervision. 50%, some experts say, have a mental health issue. Uh, we have also started tackling that at a higher level. We have, we partner with uh, mental health at intake. They're assessed while they're incarcerated. They're treated while they're incarcerated. We've also began doing telehealth across the state for the rural areas who have less opportunity to attend in person. The employment initiative the governor was talking about is 2018. We did a huge push for employment um, through the good grid and just through community awareness. And we increased our full-time overall percentage from 51 to 58% in just a little over a year. And that federal tax incentive really helped with that. Um, under Governor Hutchison, we've also passed three pieces of legislation that have um, allowed inmates to be released with at best their driver's license, a restricted permit, or at least an ID, which they will have time after release up to six months to continue paying fines and fees to get those suspensions released from their driver's license. We do AANA seven days a week in our reentry facilities and our correctional facilities. We also um, connect them to sponsors across the state. We use mentors, sponsors, and recovery coaches. We have enlisted uh, recovery coaches and we have them embedded in some of the area's offices across the state. We also ensure that um, everyone that graduates from a reentry program that they have a mentor or a sponsor. Um, we have Reentry on the Road, which is a new initiative we just started, which basically it takes a small team of, that we have in Reentry and we go from community to community to educate them on what's going on in our state, the barriers that we have faced, and the solutions that we have created to overcome them. Um, Governor Hutchison mentioned um, Restore Hope. We have been very successful with uh, prisoner reentry and foster care in them connecting the dots to those two major issues. Uh, we have eight reentry facilities, which we opened the first one in 2015. It's a 180 day program that we screen individuals about 18 months prior to their tr transfer eligibility date. We slowly transition them through um, 15 hours of programming. They're full time employed, they get family reunification, substance abuse, mental health, um, and they address their fines and fees. And when they complete the program at 180 days, their carrot is to have early parole. 
We have an online transitional housing application now. We work through the Good Grid Reentry Portal, uh, which has also helped a big push for employment. We have increased those efforts. We have employers that will actually list that they are felon friendly, and the inmates can apply straight from incarceration. Um, the online transitional housing application is just another layer to that portal, and we have increased our release from 60 days to now a max of seven days to someone to be released to a transitional house. Uh, all inmates are approved for uh, have an application prepared and submitted for insurance upon release from incarceration. We have began using the Medicaid-assisted treatment programs in Arkansas, which has been very successful to help us um, attack those opioid addictions. And then as Gov Governor Hutchison also mentioned, I'm on the Occupational Licensing Board, and we have passed some legislation to try to assist in deregulating some of those barriers, and that will be an ongoing committee for the next couple years. So as an agency, um, we have realigned our risk assessment so that we can better apply these resources to high-risk offenders, which in turn saves resources and tax dollars by not over-applying them to the low-level offenders who we know will probably be successful. Thank you for your time, and please feel free to ask me any questions. Uh, thank you, Carrie. And uh, whenever you look at uh, reentry programs and those coming out of prison, it's the right thing to do at a human level for those that are genuinely seeking a second chance. But it's also a practical thing to do because in every state we have low unemployment numbers. We're, we're uh, looking to increase those that are going into the workforce, and employers need uh, the uh, trained workforce, even those that uh, are. Uh, coming out of incarceration. I'm delighted again to be joined by Governor Reynolds, who's been a national leader in developing workforce opportunities for formerly incarcerated individuals. And we're pleased to hear from her perspective today. Governor Reynolds, thank you. Well, thank you, Governor Hutchison, and thank you for highlighting what you're spearheading in the great state of Arkansas on reentry programs. Um, Iowans recognize the power of redemption and believe in second chances, and that's why it's been one of my priorities of my administration to not only focus on eliminating barriers, but to work on rehabilitation. And honestly, it is an overall approach to our workforce uh, strategy initiatives and doing everything we can to put talent back to work. And I firmly believe that prisons should not be one stop in a circle that leads back to prison. And so we started with prison training programs like many of the states are doing. In 2015, we implemented, implemented statewide registered apprenticeship programs that offers training in all nine of our institutions. We actually have 26 occupations that are a part of the registered apprenticeship program. We're continuing to reevaluate them to make sure that we're really aligning with the high demand careers that are available in the state of Iowa. We have 350 registered apprentices that are taking advantage of the registered apprenticeship programs. Over 200 apprentices have completed and earned their national uh, certification. Last year, inmates logged over 170,000 apprenticeship hours in our correctional facilities across the state, and 18 have completed their programs and achieved their journeyman status. Iowa is also one of the states that had the opportunity to participate in the Second Chance Pell pilot program. And I know the federal administration, the administration is looking at expanding that. So if we get the opportunity, we definitely encourage states to participate in that. It's a partnership, again, with the Department of Corrections and our community colleges, one of the most successful in the country. We have 514 inmates that are completing college classes since 2016. 67 inmates currently are enrolled. Here is a great statistic that I love to talk about. The average GPA of those that are participating in the Second Chance Pell program is 3.5. And when you uh, compare that to traditional Pell students, GPA average is about 2.2. So they're taking it serious and they're very appreciative of the opportunity to do that. We also have figured out a way through technology to take it from two institutions that were offering that to all nine. So now we are expanding those learning opportunities uh, to all nine institutions. We also started a home building program. Uh, we traveled to South Dakota, Governor Nome and had implemented that in South Dakota. And uh, it's a win-win for many, on many levels. It helps them uh, earn, learn and also apply registered apprenticeship programs to that in 
electrician, plumbing, construction across the board. In our first year, working with a public-private partnership and a nonprofit, Homes for Iowa, they built four homes. We're moving these out to rural communities across the state, especially some of the communities that have been impacted by some of the disasters that we've experienced in our state. The cost of the homes, uh, this year we're 75,000. We hope to get that down to 60. These are three bedroom homes, unfinished basement, but have the um, opportunity to, um, of course, finish those off. And we hope to do, we think we can do 18 homes next year. Um, also, we'll be bringing another successful program to the state of Iowa this year, uh, and that is the Last Mile, which is an incredible program that's helping teach um, incarcerated individuals how to code in the latest technology available. I did what any other good governor would do. I was hosted by Governor Holcomb in Indiana for the President's Workforce uh, Task Force, and we actually, he held the meeting at the Women's Correctional Facility where they demonstrated last mile that they have incorporated in their institutions incredible stories, incredible results. It's been in place for 10 years, and they have yet to have one person that has participated in the program, any recidivism whatsoever. So I'm excited to work with Beth Skinner, who is my director of corrections, and get that implemented in Iowa. And then as I wrap up, one of the things that we've just started doing last year and will continue to do this year that's been really, really effective, and that has been the um, employer reentry roundtables that we are actually hosting in our correctional facilities across the state. And so it's bringing employers and HR managers into the facility and just so they have some idea of the skills that they are learning while they're institutionalized and what a great opportunity this is for them to solve their workforce needs. It gives them a chance to talk to other employers that have hired ex-offenders, to talk about the process that they went through, how successful it has been, uh, some of the challenges, some of the rewarding aspects of doing that as well. We bring individuals that have completed a program and now own their own business or are successfully employed so they can talk about their stories and the impact that that has had on their life. And we also have some of the inmate, inmates be part um, of, of the round table as well. And as I leave, often they're talking to me about how inspired they are, that people, there is hope, that there is opportunities out there. And so that has been just a win-win um, for across the board and especially for employers to see the opportunity that, ex that exists there. And we've had three round tables and have had over 250 attendees. So we've had great, great participation in that. We also are putting together a portal of employers that are willing to hire ex-offenders so that we know where to go to help streamline the process. We're putting mobility teams uh, in our prisons that will have driver's license kits that will go to the prisons and help them get their driver's license before they leave or start to identify where are the barriers uh, that are keeping them from doing it. So I'll just wrap up by saying again, Iowa's economy is growing. We have low unemployment, more Iowans working than at any other time in our state history. Um, and so Again, this is part of our overall strategy, whether it's our Future Ready Iowa Workforce Initiative, whether it's investing in STEM, work-based learning, registered apprenticeship programs in our K-12 system, or second chances. We're really doing everything that we can to not only help all Iowans uh, reach their full potential, but to continue to provide a pipeline of talent for our job creators uh, to continue to see the growth that we're seeing in our economy. So thank you. That's very encouraging uh, and inspiring, Governor Reynolds. Thank you for sharing that. And with that, I'll turn the uh, floor open to the other governors for uh, questions of uh, panelists, or you might have a comment as to what's happening in your state. Governor. Thank you very much for your leadership in this program. We're looking at doing something like that um, on our island of Guam, and we're looking to work with the apprenticeship programs through the Department of Labor and also with our Guam Community uh, College. Um, and as you were talking, I was thinking about um, what was the resistance with the employer um, sector? Uh, was there a lot of challenges that you had to overcome? And I like your roundtable um, experience. I think uh, that would help us in convincing employers to participate in this program because if they don't, it would not be successful. Um, and the other question I had is, um, is there any one industry uh, sector that employs more of the um, uh, re-entry program or is it even across the board? Can you start? Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. I'll talk about the um, employer 
reentry roundtables. I think this has been an opportunity for employers. Well, first of all, it's a perfect storm. So they need employees so bad that they're really willing to look at different opportunities to do that. So by bringing them together and giving them the opportunity to hear from other employers that have participated in the program, it's, we spend a lot of time just with Q&A and giving them the opportunity to answer. We have employers that are not only hiring them, but they're providing housing, they're paying the first month's rent, they're paying, uh, so, so they are really a key partnership uh, in all of this. Probably the tech, the vocational welding um, is probably one of the biggest areas that we've seen the most success with and, and in the trades. When it comes to the registered apprenticeship programs and manufacturing is where we've seen a lot of success with uh, those participating in the program. Uh, let me ask uh, Carrie Williams to uh, add a little bit. Okay, um, in Arkansas, what we, we've struggled with and some of the questions when we do our uh, reentry on the road initiative and speak to these employers is, for the majority of them, they want to hire somebody. It's an HR issue with some of them, but also they just tell us they want them to show up drug free. So we know on the front end that we have to tackle the substance abuse and the mental health issues, you know, and give a holistic approach to the employers. But they have come along beside us, and it, beside us, and it's just really because of education, letting them know what their workforce is. We're working harder at getting more programs inside to get them the apprenticeships coming out, um, and to get them the trade so that the organizations would actually recognize them. Other governors? Well, first, uh, I want to thank uh, both of you, all three of you, um, constructive and refreshing. I believe that criminal justice reform, including reentry, is the bipartisan or nonpartisan issue uh, of the day, uh, one where we all need to do better and one where there are so many good ideas out there. Uh, my question is, is particularly on an area that, uh, that my state needs to work on, which is revocation of parole and, and probation, uh, and, and specifically what changes uh, that you all may have made uh, as you develop these reentry uh, programs. In, in my state, our incarceration rate has increased 40 percent since 2004, and today we have more people that go into our institutions based on revocation of parole or probation than in any new crime. Uh, and specifically inside of that, we know that recovery is hard. Uh, it's very difficult and people often need multiple chances at recovery. So how do you treat, uh, for instance, a failed drug test on probation or, or parole? And, and what are those opportunities inside that system to give people a chance to achieve uh, instead of sending them back for a period of years? Let, let, let me start on that. that uh that's probably a little bit unique to every state, and uh, it's, it's hard to be uh, very clear in a conversation like this, but uh, as you pointed out, some of the violations that could lead to revocation are failing a drug test for one time. If you're in a drug treatment court, uh, you know, you fail the test one time, they're probably going to give you another chance to, uh, uh, to do better. They're going to give you some consequences there, but they're not going to send you on the first time back to prison. And so we have uh, a technical violation center. It's not the best word for it, but you know, if they fail to report one time to the probation officer, if they fail to meet an appointment, that's a technical violation. We're not going to revoke their parole, and so, we, or we're going to send them to a technical violation center for a uh, upgraded uh, consequence, but it's not full revocation. And so, uh, Governor Reynolds, did you want to comment further on that? That's a big piece of what we're looking at this year, trying to find the balance to work through that, working with the Corrections Department of Public Safety, or, and, and in addition to, because that's one of the biggest reasons we see for the recidivism rates, right? And so the other thing that some of the communities are doing is just the support system that we're putting in some of these communities so that they have access to treatment, they have access to some of the AA meetings or some of the, those services as well has been a critical component of the areas that have seen some great success with that. But that is a continued conversation that we're having this year. Thank you all very much. Gov Governor Hogan has given me the hook. Uh, <laughs> you know this could go on. No, it's a great discussion, uh, Governor, and we thank all of the panelists very much. Uh, we're back on our schedule almost, and uh, we've got the governor's only meeting and several other governors to present other topics. But yeah, I know there's plenty of questions we could talk about this all afternoon, but I want to thank you, 
Governor, both governors and, and, and Ms. Williams, thank you very much. We appreciate it. We're going to move on now to uh, the uh, immediate past chairman of the NGA. I was his wingman for a year as vice chair, and he's, he's uh, back here to talk with Governor Polis about uh, uh, broadband innovation. Governor Bullock. Thanks so much, Governor Hogan. And while many folks think of broadband as an infrastructure issue, it's really one that has to be viewed as a workforce solution for our states as well. Certainly pleased to get to share some of the work that Montana is doing to make broadband connectivity a reality for all of our citizens. If you live in one of Montana's urban areas, it's likely certainly that you'll have access to reliable and high-speed broadband. Our best da data indicates about 92% of urban Montanans have access to broadband. If you look nationally, it's about 97% of people in urban areas have access to broadband. We also know that high-speed connectivity gives students access to that 21st century classroom, prepares them to live in that rapidly advancing technology-driven market. We also know it's going to foster economic development by supporting small businesses, creating jobs. But if you live in a rural community in Montana, geography, low population, all of it discourages investment by many telecommunications companies. That means only about 59% of rural Montanans have access to broadband and the opportunities that come with it. And this isn't just a frontier state issue. If we look across the country, only about 65% of people in this country in rural areas have access. So during my administration, we've tried to take steps to, uh, several approaches to kind of bridge that gap between rural and urban communities. In 2015, the state of Montana and I, we partnered, began a partnership with a nonprofit group called Education Superhighway to increase access to affordable high speed broadband in Montana schools. If I look back then in 2015, only about three quarters of our schools could access broadband in accordance with the uh, Federal Communications Commission's minimum goals. Over that five-year period now, 100% of our K-12 students have access to broadband. It's really equipping those schools with that 21st century technology, allowing teachers to be innovative, preparing students to be successful in our modern and changing workforce. In that five-year period alone, over 60% of our schools have been upgraded to fiber. And for all of our schools, medium bandwidth has increased by nearly five times. And we've also been able to then drive down the cost because the medium cost of bandwidth has decreased by 76% over that same five-year period. Now, we know Montana students, whether they live in urban or rural communities, are now receiving the best education possible to be successful in a modern economy. Never forget a trip I took to eastern Montana, a town called Plevna. Could almost be mistaken because it's near Governor Burgum in North Dakota. Has a population of 163 people. Participate in an hour of code with dang near their whole school, which was about a dozen kids. But that one hour introduction to computer science is designed to show that anybody can learn the basics and to encourage students to start looking at careers in high demand fields. And that wouldn't have been possible, certainly, had the school not been equipped with high-speed fiber connections. Those students from that small farming community likely wouldn't have had the same access to computer science coursework as their more urban counterparts. Broadband in our schools is critical to ensuring equity of opportunity for all students. We look at it a federal investment, that, you know, and it's interesting hearing the speaker say about a four trillion dollar, three or four trillion dollar infrastructure deficit. Some would say it'd be about 61 billion to get rural connectivity. We still can't wait though just for the federal government to take those steps. We've also looked into ways to establish connectivity between beyond our classrooms in small towns. Earlier this year, I tasked my lieutenant governor with touring a handful of small Montana towns, identified tangible ways to expand economic opportunities in rural and our tribal communities. We heard from those community leaders and stakeholders about their opportunities, their challenges, look for ways that public or private partnerships could, could actually assist. And one of the consistent things that we heard was lack of reliable broadband, holding communities back from reaching their full potential. One of those communities is a town called Troy. It's about 1,000 people in northwest Montana. It's indeed a small community. It has so much to offer, located on the banks of a river, scenic mountains, 
track residents and visitors alike for its abundance of outdoor recreation opportunities. <coughs> but without broadband, new businesses are really discouraged from establishing themselves in Troy. Growth of any existing businesses is limited and new technologies can find. To address that, we partnered with both our local stakeholders and the Telecommunications Association, brought in Deloitte Consulting to develop what would be a connectivity roadmap outlining the steps to make high-speed, quality broadband a reality for Troy. Consist creating that map took about 12 weeks of engaging with stakeholders hosting those planning workshops, but the result was really that framework that laid out the challenges, the approaches to address them, and most importantly, specific next steps to move forward. Funding Toolkit explains the funding resources, makes recommendations for the best options for Troy. There's 51 different federal broadband loan and grant programs. Communities need help actually navigating those complex processes. And as Troy moves forward now with it on its own project, we anticipate that roadmap is going to guide for, be a guide for other communities, help connect the nearly 40% of Montana and still without reliable connectivity. We know that already in five years, uh, efforts to expand broadband have made a meaningful difference for our Montana students. Our future progress on that issue will bring economic opportunity then to those rural communities, also ensure that they have the resources to thrive. This really is an area where I think governors can make a difference and find solutions especially if we look for ways to engage in partnerships and as governors continue to work together. The policies and innovative ideas that we can put into place to enhance broadband in a, both our rural and our urban area communities have an impact on every person that we serve. So thanks for allowing me to share a little bit of Montana's successes and challenges uh, with all of you. And now I'd like to turn it over to Governor Polis of Colorado. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, thank you, Governor Bullock. Um, you know, Colorado is a very uh, diverse state geographically and uh, from a demographic perspective. You know, cities, Colorado Springs, Denver, Aurora, suburbs, exurbs, rural areas. So we're going to have a swath of it all, including uh, difficult geographic terrain, uh, mountains, uh, high plains. But you know, as we know, in the 21st century, broadband and cr is, is absolutely critical infrastructure that everyone needs. It's, it's not just about the consumer experience, which it is, whether it's Netflix or Amazon or Hulu, or whatever you're using. And by the way, that's the consumer expectation. If you want to attract millennials to, to live in an area, they have to have that. But it's a lot more than that, too. It's also about a better education for young people. It gives rural businesses connectivity they need to compete in a global economy. It's about telecommuting opportunities for people uh, who, who can have location-independent employment, living in some of those beautiful areas in the country and be able to telecommute. Not just not just what you might call high-end jobs. You traditionally might think telecommuting, maybe they're an architect or an attorney. It also means it can be high school educated folks working in a call center virtually, living in a community that has lower cost of living and a higher quality of life. Uh, High-speed connectivity is also a lifeline for first, re first responders, telemedicine, uh, really critical for people's health as well. In Colorado, 86% of our rural households have access to broadband. Our goal is to increase it to 92% by 2020, by mid this year, 100% by 2024, so in just four years. We have a state broadband de deployment board at our Department of Regulatory Affairs, which has committed over $19 million since 2016 for the last mile infrastructure. And our Department of Local Affairs is spending $5 million per year for the middle mile infrastructure. Uh, to help get access to some of our more remote communities. Um, the year before I took office, our legislature enacted regulations to prevent existing internet providers from easily capturing grants from new operators. We want to draw new market entrants. I also signed legislation that allows broadband providers to tap into electrical easements that already exist. So we can start building, we can remove barriers to building broadband uh, without having to deal with the myriad of property ownership issues uh, that can prevent the construction of new infrastructure. So we uh, engage with our private sector partners. We have a couple towns that have done municipal broadband, generally um, smaller towns. But uh, when you take the problem holistically, uh, it's important to note that we have to get there. The economic benefits of getting there are great, uh, as well as uh, helping to meet the overall goals of uh, rural economic success. When we launched our, our uh, blueprint for rural economic prosperity, 
the expansion of high-speed connectivity to our rural communities was really front and center uh, critical for small businesses and Main Street retailers, just as it is for uh, people who might uh, telecommute from home or need to access uh, life-saving medical services from home. So look forward to engaging with the other governors as we work to optimize our strategy to expand connectivity across our state. Thank you, Governor Polis. Uh, questions, comments, things happen in other states. Governor Kelly. Yeah. I, actually, Governor Bullock, I'm very intrigued by uh, your discussion of Troy and the fact that you've got connectivity at your schools and you're looking for ways to expand that. I think there's actually an article in the New York Times today that talks about Cottonwood Falls, Kansas, uh, where we have exactly the same thing. Cottonwood Falls is dead center, uh, Kansas. So the, the school district has connectivity, but the community does not, and it's actually losing businesses, and certainly businesses are refusing to move in because they don't have uh, this access. So you figured out some way to fund it for the school. Do you have a plan for funding to expand outside the school? You, you know, the challenge, and it is a real challenge as much as for these smaller towns too, because on the one hand, it may not look like it's cost effective to even be laying the fiber along the way. I mean, I'd love to, not supposed to be putting pitches in for necessarily private companies, but having, we had folks from Deloitte that went up there and spent several weeks engaging all the stakeholders, really put together that plan of how that they can get there. And then we're doing it again with them um, for one of our tribal nations where connectivity just doesn't exist. And it's bringing all the stakeholders together, figuring out, but I don't have necessarily a pot of money that I can, from the state level, to give to a community like Troy. What I can do is try to marshal the resources and also recognize the myriad of programs that you can also get from a federal loan and grant program that exist. Other questions, comments, what you're doing in your state? Governor Bergen. Uh, first of all, Governor Polis, Governor Bullock, uh, congrats on all the great work you're doing. Uh, and, and I would say uh, uh, it, maybe it's a part, part of the question to uh, Governor Kelly, but having the same issue of once we got all the schools connected uh, in this interconnected world, we've got to get it out to every combine, every tractor, every rancher on a horse, uh, everybody that's out, you know, monitoring any kind of energy activity. You've got to get it to every, every uh, one of, every of the 2,000 wind towers we have in our state. And some of that may have to go wireless, you know, for that last mile. And, and so we're trying to explore a number of different things where, you know, whether it's uh, TV white spaces, which is spectrum that's available, uh, whether it's other forms of uh, extended wireless. But that's one of the things that we're trying to do because it's just not cost effective to actually string the fiber all that extra distance. But uh, you guys are doing some great work. Uh, keep it up. It's, uh, when, when your states do well, it makes it, uh, we can use that as examples to help push uh, stuff forward in ours. So it, we, all, we all climb the ladder when we're pushing each other. One thing I would say that uh, when we get all the schools connected, which we have, we've got a gigabyte to every school in, in North Dakota uh, and did that through a combination of private sector plus a, a, set, a, a cooperative of all of the rural telephone cooperatives. Uh, and so that has created a thing called the Dakota Carrier Network work across the rural, the rural co-ops and, and uh, they, they laid the backbone and then we're able to get everywhere. But then when, now when we've got every school connected, uh, you know, now we run into the situation we talked about earlier with the cyber issues. So we did push through last year, which we think may be the first uh, cyber curriculum for every grade level. And it, we wouldn't think about it like what does a second grader have to know to be safe when they're on when they're connected doing their work at that school. Uh, what's a fourth grader have to know? What do you have to know in your junior high? So we've actually created a curriculum and built it in. So instead of just teaching consumer uh, computer science in high school, we're teaching uh, cyber security skills at every grade level all the way through. And then also added cyber security as a course for people to be able to take in high school in addition to the computer science because it's a growing field and there's hundreds of thousands of cyber jobs that are available. So it's got a uh, both protect students but a long-term workforce uh, component, and we'd be happy to share some of the work we did relative to building out that curriculum and getting it approved by K-12 and moving that forward. That's great, Governor Bergham. I'd also say to Governor Kelly and others, too, like, if you ask, let me have a map of my state and all of wh who has broadband access and who doesn't, it's not an easy thing to get, right, because it's all private 
entities and sharing that information makes it that much more difficult. I mean, we have been undertaking just trying to get broadband mapping. And another thing that I think we all have to think about, like we all talk about trying to get these big infrastructure projects and proposals through our legislature. And I've never included broadband as part of the definition of that infrastructure, you know, it's because there's such unmet water, sewer needs, schools, bridges. But we really do have to start thinking of it as not only that economic driver, but I think as base infrastructure. So if local communities like a Troy or the one that you referenced could also look to some pot of money at the state level as well to help facilitate that. Other thoughts, questions? Yes. Yeah. Actually, Governor Bullock, uh, we have started to include it in our in our infrastructure plan. Uh, you know, we're uh, we've got a, a new 10-year comprehensive transportation uh, plan before the legislature right now, and part of that plan includes you know as long as you one digging you know, and then lay the fiber. Uh, that won't get us the last mile, but it will get us a long way down the road. That's great. Governor Reynolds. We have made an investment at the state level, and really for a relatively small investment, if you leverage private sector funding, you can really start to make a difference. So I asked the legislature for $20 million, which allowed me to leverage $120 million private sector funding. Uh, I was able to get five. We had 1.3 held. So with $6.3 million, we were able to implement 17 projects in the state of Iowa. And then we stacked that with USDA funding that came in. We qualified for four projects. And so with relatively small investment, smaller investment, we've been able to really scale some of these rural areas and provide them the connectivity that they need to survive. We're not going to grow rural Iowa without connectivity. We're not going to get our young people to stay in those communities, and it impacts every single thing that we did. So I'm back this year asking for another $15 million to continue to leverage not only the private sector, but to take advantage of the federal funding that's there, too, and I think they're coming out with more opportunities for states to take advantage of that. It's great, and at the Western Governor's uh, breakfast this morning, we had a number of cabinet folks there, and one of them said that there may be additional opportunities for federal dollars to either match or other complement, but also, Governor Hogan, as you're looking at, you would mentioned earlier today, of trying to put together overall ideas for what the federal government could do. I mean, those investments in rural infrastructure, if we're ever really going to be that country where everybody has that opportunity to succeed educationally and economically, um, we can't leave rural communities behind, and that's an area where the federal government can help fill some of the gaps. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, great discussion. We're going to move on to our final panel, closing out and uh, batting cleanup. We have uh, the chair of the Economic Development and Commerce Committee, Governor Ducey, is going to lead a discussion along with Governor Kelly on uh, removing occupational licensing barriers to employment. Governor Ducey. Thank you very much, Governor Hogan, and thank you, Governor Bullock. And uh, I want to say while you'll hear uh, Governor Kelly and I talking about occupational licensing, I hope what you're really hearing is how to grow prosperity in your individual state, because that's what this reform really does do. In Arizona, we've worked hard to make our state a land of opportunity for all. We've been fighting for occupational licensing reform for years. In 2015, we eliminated occupational licensing requirements for citrus, fruit and vegetable packers, yoga instructors at the request of yoga instructors, and driving school instructors. In 2017, we waived licensing fees for people earning less than 200 percent of the federal poverty level. <clears throat> and we were proud that last year Arizona led the nation uh, in lifting people out of poverty, and we believe that that policy had uh, a, a place in, in that uh, good result. So several years ago, we wanted to expand this even further. Arizona began recognizing licenses that were out of state for military spouses. It worked well, so the thought was, why not extend this same freedom to everyone? Today, we're proud to say that Arizona is leading the way as the first state in the nation to grant universal recognition of occupational licenses from other states. So the idea is straightforward. We believe that you don't lose your skills just because you pack up a U-Haul and move from one state to our state. We're happy that you did. 
We want to welcome you. We want you to be able to get to work and earn a living. So this is about working men and women of America who are looking for their shot at the American dream, and we want to make sure that there's no obstacle in their way to pursue it. Behavioral health professionals, dental professionals, contractors, and more, over 600 Arizonans have received licenses under this new law in just a few months. Just one example is after we passed the law, and I believe before it even went into effect, I was back here in D.C. visiting. Uh, Arizonan came up to me in, in the airport, uh, introduced himself, and was thrilled about the law, but didn't think that it would uh, support the license that he had. I asked him what his license was, and he said it was a CP he was a certified public accountant. And while we did pass it more for the trades and those types of things that you see in other states, the law does cover certified public accountants. So now he's <clears throat> in Arizona, wanted to move there full time. He's going to get his license and get to work. So we're proud of this progress. We think there's real opportunity on this front, and we're not going to slow down or rest on that laurel. This year, we've got a bill in the legislature that will require regulatory boards and commissions to have ordinary people. And I mean ordinary people and not industry insiders or cronies that are there to block or stifle competition to make sure that it's those citizens that reflect the majority of the membership of these boards. The goal is to give unbiased public members more influence on these boards' decisions. There's also a bill that will stop these boards from collecting additional fees once they hit a certain threshold of cash reserves. We have some of our boards stockpiling millions of dollars in cash while still collecting fees on hardworking Arizonans, and we want that to end. And we are going to waive occupational licensing fees for our military heroes and their spouses. Just as Arizona, at this same setting over other NGA meetings has been able to glean so many great ideas from other states over the years. I, even though I believe this is a competitive advantage for Arizona in terms of population growth, I'd like to see every other state apply it because I think it will help the prosperity of our, our nation and allow people with skills to get to work without obstacles in their way. This is something I think you'll find broad bipartisan support for. That's what we found in Arizona. So I want to thank you and turn it over to Governor Laura Ke Kelly from Kansas to tell us what's going on in the heartland. Governor? Well, if I could, I would just walk out of the room right now and fly back home and talk to my legislature about <laughs> uh, passing the exact same law because I'm very concerned about losing Kansans uh, to Arizona. Uh, because I agree with you. I think, I think it is a very smart thing to do. And in some ways, to me, it's, it's actually personal because I grew up in a military family, and uh, it would have been impossible for my mother to have a career uh, as we moved every year and a half to three years. And so uh, just from that vantage point, I, I think that this is important. And that's one of the things that, that we are looking at in Kansas, is ways to essentially emulate what you have done uh, in Arizona. We've taken sort of baby steps uh, at this point. We have entered into a nurse licensing compact uh, with other states so that at least uh, folks in the, the nursing field uh, can, can move to Kansas and continue to practice. Uh, that is particularly important uh, on our military installations. Uh, we have also, you know, and, and here we're looking more at uh, the reentry issues. Uh, and we are, we've worked with our licensing boards uh, to prevent them from considering any offenses that occurred uh, five years before the application uh, goes in. And we've also had them uh, remove phrasing like moral turpitude and good character because that allows way too much uh, subjectivity to occur when uh, those uh, license applications are being uh, considered. Another way we're approaching this, though, is uh, our Department of Revenue is actually taking mobile units down to our corrections facilities and uh, working to 
get some of those folks uh, their commercial driver's licenses so that when they are released from, from prison, uh, they'll be certified uh, to do that. We have a tremendous shortage uh, in uh, CDLs. We, we got a lot of highways uh, and a lot of distribution centers uh, in Kansas, and that's a real high need. So we are, we are looking at that. Uh, and then we are continuing to look just across the board. I mean, if I'm not sure, you, you say it's bipartisan, I'm not sure though that I could get something uh, you know, as sweeping as your uh, bill through the legislature, but we're gonna continue to just chip away at this because uh, we, like every other state, uh, really have severe workforce shortages in just about every area. Uh, I will say that you know, I think uh, Kim, it was you who talked about the welding uh, yeah. in the in the prisons. You know, we do have a number of, of programs now that uh, at where our inmates actually go to the workplace uh, and are uh, participating. A lot of it is welding. Some of it's uh, other kind of manufacturing. Uh, and what we're, we're getting those folks uh, into apprenticeships, getting them licensed and trained. Uh, and then uh, actually we're finding that they, they're staying and being employed. Uh, and we are, we're working very hard to expand that kind of programming uh, within our correction system. Uh, we, our new Secretary of Corrections that we stole from Idaho uh, is working very closely with our community tech colleges uh, and, and with um, our employers in the area. Uh, so we expect that to expand, and you know, I, I believe uh, Governor Leon Guerrero it was you who talked about you know getting businesses to work in this. We've approached a number of the businesses on this issue of uh, reentry, and they've been very open. Um, they're so short of workers right now. They're, you know, I think if the unemployment situation were different, we might not get that kind of response. But they're very, very engaged with this. In fact, we are working. Uh, together with Coke Industries, um, to who has a, they have a real serious um, interest in criminal justice reform yes. overall, uh, but specifically in this kind of thing because the the getting people licensed, getting them certified, uh, really will prevent uh, a, a lot of recidivism. Well, thank you very much, uh, Governor Kelly, and congratulations on the success that you're having. Thanks for the kind words and. Uh, and also reaching out to find all the uh, different uh, available partners for this. Much like criminal justice reform, this is a fairness issue. And uh, that's how we positioned it. And when you hear the testimony of some of the people that have uh, or are living in your state and can't access work or have these obstacles in front of them that cost thousands of dollars and hundreds of hours uh, when they, they have the skill right now and they've been certified somewhere else and they're in good standing. And if we can help with any of that, we're, we're happy to. Like I said, I'd like to see this expanded uh, everywhere across the country. Uh, any questions or, or comments or states that are doing other things? Uh, Governor Herbert, Utah. Well, thanks. Thanks to all three of you. I appreciate uh, the leadership you've demonstrated on this and the issues you've brought to a forefront. A few years ago, we did what you're doing, uh, Governor Ducey, in allowing military spouses to come, particularly those who are teachers, to come and have reciprocity from another state. Uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by your idea of expanding to all other occupations and interested to know what that will uh, look like. Uh, but the question I have for you is, do you have any concern, whatever the threshold is in Arizona, as you've said, here's the threshold for qualification to do whatever, dental assistant, welder, you know, uh, teacher, are you concerned that you're going to not meet that threshold when you have reciprocity from other states that may not have as high threshold, I'm not saying that's the case, but is that a concern for you that you may not get the same kind of quality? Uh, that maybe comes with reciprocity would have lesser education. Thanks, Governor Herbert. It's a good question, and it was certainly something that was on our mind because, you know, whenever you expand something, there can be an unintended consequence. But with the diligence that we did looking at the other states, the requirements that were out there, the fact that there there is a check and a balance, meaning you don't have your license automatically transferred. You, you have to check in and register, and then you're checked 
to make certain that you're in good standing in the state from which you came from, and then working with our industry leaders. They were also, because they're having a tough time filling these jobs and positions, they, they need to hire people. It was really some of the folks that sit on these boards that might operate the, the, the training schools that would benefit from someone having to, to delay uh, weeks or, or months uh, to go into the workforce. So it's been a good experience so far, and uh, we think it's going to be a positive. Well, I can tell I'm fascinated with it. I want to look into that a little more. Uh, it, it reminds me of becoming a free agent, it, uh, the power of the worker. They have more options, more places they can sell their <coughs> skills. and so. I think that's a benefit to those in the labor force. And I, I think in this booming economy, I hear from every governor that uh, we all have issues finding employees, whether it's at the entry level or at the highest level. It's a way for us, we found that many of these boards and commissions were standing in front of us and, and blocking us uh, as, as an obstacle. This is something that, like I said, we had bipartisan support on. We were able to leapfrog over that and, and expand our workforce. Governor Polis? Yeah, it's, it's uh, really, we um, uh, have, you know, reciprocity for military spouses in Colorado. We're working on opening it up more, but um, thanks for your leadership in, in Arizona on this. It's a great uh, national model that we can learn from. One of the ones you mentioned, you know, mixing up some of those boards so that they don't, they have more disinterested parties on it. The chat, and I want to do, we want to do that too, and, and there is, you know, many of the statutes allow flexibility, but how do you get people that aren't in the game to apply and want to be on those boards, right? I mean, if you're trying to find disinterested lay people, uh, it's a lot easier said than done. I mean, how do you go out and you get people who don't have, because you don't want people with a bias against or for, right? I mean, you really want a disinterested person to do something for their state. But uh, do you have to be active yourself in that recruitment, or how do you get people to step up to those boards that are less glamorous, let's say? Sure, good question. You know. I think in my last four state of the states, I've gone after our boards and commissions because in many ways they've been, they've been bullies in this. And we had a government funded lobbyists that were actually sitting on these boards. Uh, and we did have the executive uh, authority in the governor's office to terminate those, those lobbyists. I didn't know why the taxpayers sh should pay for lobbyists that want to block uh, folks or, or protect industries from a fair and, and level playing field. So yes, we will have to be active in recruitment. I imagine you have friends that don't want to come work in the governor's office uh, or people you know that want to participate as a citizen in good government and that will be just fair arbitrators on these boards um, uh, to level the playing field. And I'm just talking about the amount of constituents that contact, who want to get involved, uh, but are outside of the industry, are, are not part of the, 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 the crony, uh, people that, that block positive reforms and good decisions. Governor Bullock? Yeah, Governor Polis, I'd say high school friends even. Yeah. <laughs> Meaning like for some of these boards, because we all have citizen representatives, like I'm just leaning on people, please. And then by and large, once they do it, uh, they're quite engaged. And I don't know if any of you have had real successes. I tried the last legislative session. There's a lot of these boards that at the end of the day, I don't know that we should be regulating them. And so I had this thought, we're going to get rid of a whole bunch of boards. And I think by the end of it, I got rid of four boards. And it is a challenge legislatively as well, because there's always vested interest of saying, no, we have to be continuing to regulate these, even if the level of regulation is probably of limited utility. Yeah, our, our posture on this has been we want to make sure that we're measuring twice, cutting once, what's the purpose, what's the reason, how does it protect health or, or safety. We have been able to, to eliminate a, a, a number of boards, but we want to see this reform and we think the best way to do it is to have unbiased citizens th that sit and participate. Any other questions, comments? I have a question. Yes, please, um, Governor. So is this occupational reform only for U.S. licensed occupations, not foreign licensed occupations? It would be a, a United States license, and I, I would want to check the fine print, but I believe, like any reciprocity between um, uh, the territories, uh, 
would, would be accepted, but uh, I'd want to double check so, before I made uh, that commitment. Governor, so we did a bill, this took a bill. Uh, we now count foreign work experience for cosmetology hours. So when we have an immigrant who, who did work experience in Mexico or China, wherever it is, that can count towards their requirement. So we're looking, uh, it's not exactly what you said. We don't, I have no idea what those countries do for licensing, but if they have real work experience, it can count towards your hours so they can practice their trade sooner and start earning a living in Colorado. Good stuff. Thank you. If there's no more comments or questions, I want to thank Governor Kelly, and I'm going to turn it back over to Governor Hogan and point out that we're uh, uh, under budget and ahead of schedule. I, I, I want to thank everybody for helping get us back on schedule. Thank all the governors and all the presenters. It was a great discussion. Uh, for the governors, our next uh, uh, governors only meeting, which is going to be a very important one, is 2:45. So we actually get our first break. But this is our uh, this is our last uh, public plenary session, and I want to take this opportunity to thank the 44 governors and their spouses and their staffs, all the state officials all of the folks that came out from the presenters and everybody who attended the conference. It's been a terrific, uh, I think, couple of days, and we want to thank everybody for participating. And with that, I'll officially uh, end the, uh, the 2020 uh, winter meeting of the National Governors Association.